Welcome to the TLGS 2024 conference. I'm Wendy Doucette from East Tennessee State University and I'll be moderating today's session. I'll also be collecting questions in the chat. Um, I now turn it over to our presenters who will discuss graduate students productivity tools for literature review research and writing in the age of AI. Thank you, we're very excited to be here. Um, my name is Carmen Orthalfi and my colleague is Paul Thomas. We're from the University of Kansas. Um, we both work in the research engagement division um, and the unit of the research and learning. And then we're within the center of, um, for graduate initiatives and engagement. And we're both very much involved in working with graduate students um, Paul is our resident um, expert on EndNote and Zotero, and he works with graduate students from the very beginning of when there's uh, graduate students to learn those tools, and he also is responsible for um, meeting with a lot of graduate students as they submit their theses and dissertations and finish up that formatting so everything's completed. I'm a, an instruction librarian with uh, one of my focuses being on um, instruction for graduate students, um, various initiatives. We have a program that we work um, with others on campus, like our writing center and our office for graduate affairs. Um, we want to point out that we are, we do not conceive ourselves as experts on this topic. Um, rather, like many of you, we're trying to grapple with this um, age of generative AI, uh, AI and um, we are, um, constantly working to expand our role in helping graduate students through um, especially that literature review process and writing process. And so we work very closely with other colleagues. Um, we wanted to pause for just a moment and point out that while we're going to be talking about tools, we don't want to forget about the fact that, um, as Booth put in the craft of um, research, that writing is thinking and that research is hard. And we still have to use any tool in a very critical thinking manner and to be cognizant of um, how we're choosing, what tools we're choosing to use and how we're using them. And that brings us to kind of the topic that we'll be discussing today, which is productivity tools and artificial intelligence, or, or at least productivity tools in the age of artificial intelligence. So in the fast evolving world of academia, it's not, not hyperbole to say that generative AI and algorithm based productivity tools like chat GPT research rabbit and LitMap are quickly becoming transformative forces reshaping the way graduate students, among many groups, approach the research and writing of thesis, dissertation, literature re reviews. But while this plethora of possibilities engendered by generative productivity tools is in many ways remarkable, the technology itself can often be overwhelming, not only for the graduate students, but also for the librarians and information professionals supporting the independent re researchers from any discipline. Um, indeed, the ever-growing number of AI tools on the market suggests that the era of artificial intelligence is here, and for this reason, it is critical that we develop skills to provide support and guidance to the increasing number of graduate students engaging with these advanced technologies. In this session, um, we will focus on providing librarians with skills necessary to effectively communicate with graduate students about productivity tools, enabling the creation of original um, research and writing. We will present a, a structured framework um, that's predicated heavily on established educational and LIS research um, that can be used to categorize productivity tools. In a sense, this framework that we're gonna present will provide librarians and other information professionals with a useful wayfinder that enables the diverse range of productivity tools available to contextualize situationally, making them easier to understand. We will then explore and curate um, a selection of the AI generative and other tools, showcasing their potential to facilitate various stages of independent and original graduate research. Um, we also will briefly address the ethical and legal considerations entwined with the recommendations and implementations of these tools, thus fostering a culture of informed and ethical ILS research and practice. 
Um, after attending this session, librarians, we hope, will arguably have a better understanding of the tools that are out there, empowering them to match these tools with specific needs of the graduate students that they serve. So we're going to um, talk about four, uh, explore four different um, frameworks that we investigate it. We looked at many others. Um, so you can imagine that we went on to uh, Google and did a search uh, for images, for research process, workflows, et cetera. Um, but we wanted to highlight just four of those. The first one we want to point out is that um, the craft of research outlines uh, a process of starting with um, generating your idea all the way through completing your, your final paper. Um, this publication um, that many librarians will uh, promote and recommend on LibGuides and other ways um, was first published in 1995. Um, the current edition is in the fourth edition, but a fifth edition is coming out this summer. And we believe that the, in general, how Booth just and his uh, co-authors describe the the research process and writing process mirrors how we ultimately are thinking about um, how to uh, frame the process for writing a literature review, researching a literature review, writing a literature review, and thinking about the tools within that process. So the first one I want to point out is um, from. Uh, Inja, Holdley, and Kirshner, they have done um, several research articles um, having to do with um, research workflows and thinking about different tools. And they conceptualize um, the process um, using four information, I mean, four literacies, um, information literacy, um, information management, knowledge management, and scholarly com communications. Um, while this framework we think provides a good uh, way of thinking about the skills that we want to help share and build with ourselves and with um, our graduate students that we serve, um, we think that it's not quite the right framework for us to discuss the tools. The second one that I want to point out is um, also coming from librarians who um, uh, really also in addition to the previous uh, authors are promoting that librarians should be doing more than just um, providing access to resources and that we have a, a major role to play in this entire process. Um, as uh, uh, Lubke and his colleagues say, um, instruction doesn't end with um, how you can import your resources into EndNote, um, rather it continues on. So they came up with a paperless workflow that they describe as um, three phases, one being store and organize, the second phase being read and um, annotate, and the fourth, um, third phrase phase being upload and analyze and write. The last one we want to point out is from Kramer and Bozeman, and um, they did a lot of research on, on tools and workflows um, starting in uh, the mid, uh, like around 2015 was when their first publication came out, and they continued to do some more additional research. And this um, diagram is showing their uh, dis description uh, categories for the workflow. They did have one extra category that uh, appears on some of their diagrams and in their, in their research, which is preparation. Um, but you'll see that they use the, the words uh, discovery, analyze, writing, publication, outreach, and assessment. They also, um, like the first example, come from a scholarly communications background. And so that's kind of reflected in this. Uh, um, I encourage everyone to look at um, the work that they've done um, while it is now very much out of date because of a generative AI tools. Um, there's a, a great deal of value in how they describe and um, consider workflows and various tools. And so I would encourage you to look at that work if you're not familiar with it. And then um, we decided to just build on everything we've been looking at, these four examples, many, many more. And Paul is going to walk us through um, our um, 
the way we've decided to think about the workflow and these productivity tools um, and encourage other librarians to um, expand their knowledge about this. So for this project, uh, we conceived of seven different phases of the uh, lit review uh, research and writing process. Um, we're referring to them as iterative phases because they never truly, you know, begin and end when we want them to. Often they can repeat or we can move on to a different one and then return to a, you know, a previous uh, phase. Uh, there's a lot of looping and a lot of interconnectivity. Um, but for the purposes of this, we're going to conceive of them as seven separate um, phases that we can kind of uh, discuss individually. But it's very important to remember that they all kind of bleed into one another and they're all connected and that, you know, it's not necessarily true that one will always lead to the next. Um, there's a lot of variability. So uh, the seven phases are generating information, searching for information, recording information, analyzing information, uh, writing up that information, remixing information, and then sharing the information. Each one of these uh, phases can also be conceived as having three different dimensions. The first is sort of the traditional uh, approach to uh, whatever the phase we're considering. Um, this is going to include uh, quote unquote old school methods um, for you know generating information or analyzing or what have you. Uh, we're also going to look at modern uh, approaches, which is usually sort of the information age approach. Um, you know, uh, with the advent of the internet and advanced technologies, those sort of things. And then finally, we will be looking at innovative approaches, which are going to include uh, often generative AI uh, tools, not always, um, but but often of that, that sort. So the first phase is the generating information phase. Uh, and we have defined this as the phase in which a student ideates a possible research question through the use of experimentation, discussion, creative thinking, and spontaneous writing. This is the part uh, where they are coming up with ideas. They are, are brainstorming. And so for traditional, we have examples of, you know, writing on a piece of paper, your, your ideas, playing exquisite corpse with, with concepts, that sort of thing. Also talking to a librarian and just discussing with someone uh, the ideas that you might have. Uh, those are, you know, tried and true methods. Uh, we also have mo the modern approach, which um, probably took off in the 90s, um, is the idea of like prompt web websites where you can s tell a computer what you are interested in learning, and it can help you kind of formulate a thesis question, a thesis statement. Um, and then, of course, that led to innovative tools with uh, generative AI, especially uh, with programs like ChatGPT and Microsoft Copilot, where you can just explicitly say, hey, I'm wanting to write this paper, and I need a thesis, or I need an idea, or I need a concept to, to anchor it uh, around. What should I do? And it can kind of help you come up with, or in some cases, just generate uh, the, uh, that information for you. Um, this is a phase where innovation is really starting to, uh, to dominate, especially with, uh, with students who are writing papers, but it's not as readily discussed as you might think. Um, I think a lot of people still assume that ideas are coming from students or writers' heads, whereas increasingly people are turning to generative AI uh, to, to come up with some of that um, content. And here's a, a chart of some of the, just a few of the programs that are kind of focused on generating uh, information and it's they are considered across the spectrum of the other phases as well. So not every program is you know good for only one thing. So if something like ChatGPT or Poe are writing uh, tools, but they also are good at generating information. They're also good at remixing that information. Um, you know, Grammarly the same way. Perplexity, which is more of a search engine, can also you can ask it a question and it can help you come up with some some concepts and some ideas. So there is a little bit of variability here. The second phase is the searching for information phase. This is the iterative uh, phase where a student locates sources, um, either, you know, methodically going through an entire database page of results or sporadically casually browsing, browsing through a bookshelf. Um, you know, just they find something spontaneously. Uh, regardless, it, they're looking for information in some sense. And then they examine those uh, information sources for uh, information or data points. So traditional method for searching for information would be something like a card catalog that had metadata about book or what have you that allowed a student or a researcher to go to the catalog, find that information, physically find that information on the card, and then find it physically on, on a shelf. Um, in the modern world, we have electronic databases like Google Scholar that 
do what the traditional card catalog did only in a digital space uh, and arguably a little faster depending on what we're working with and you also have things like live guides that uh you know point students in the right directions or, or point people in the right directions and then with innovation um we have things like perplexity research rabbit lit maps um these are tools that are embracing the generative technology out there to ma basically make searching easier and uh, more comprehensive perplexity in particular is a, uh, I guess it's kind of billed as like a Google alternative that uses generative technology to to perform pretty comprehensive searches uh, for for online content. Um, and this is an area where uh, innovation is really starting to begin to dominate. Obviously, modern and traditional sources are still in use, but that innovation is really starting to show um, that it has kind of the edge, uh, usually with speed. And here again is uh, another chart of some of those tools that are in this case, focused on searching, but can be used with uh, uh, during other phases. Um, things like perplexity and research rabbit and semantic scholar and lit maps all are kind of focused on helping students find resources and information uh, or researchers in general. I shouldn't just say students, but they also can be used to you know analyze connections between uh, research or or discover uh, similar authors or, or that sort of thing. This brings us to recording information, which is the phase where a student captures and documents information, and by extension, informational metadata in some sort of format um, for the purpose of citation, analysis, sharing, or future retrieval. And so a traditional method would be the, the old index card method of writing down the citation, putting it on the ground, and you know, drawing like a, taking a piece of string and connecting it to another note card or something like that. Um, then you have the more modern approach, which is to use citation management software, which is sort of my specialty. So things like EndNote and Zotero, which can store citations, but then also generate bibliographies when, when needed. And then we also have a, sort of a more innovative approach, which is something like PowerNotes, you know, technology that's uh, making it a little easier to integrate note taking and, and uh, information recording in the research and writing process. I would say that this of the phases we are talking about, this is one of the few where the modern methods still are still dominate. Um, EndNote and Zotero are, are still kind of the premier approaches for managing citations. I'm sure that there are generative AI approaches out there, and I'm sure that EndNote and Zotero will eventually embrace those uh, capabilities. But right now, um, most of the recording information is still kind of in that modern uh, phase of, of tech technological, speedy, digital, but still kind of done largely by a human rather than an algorithm. And then here's an example of some of those uh, some of those programs. Um, you, you'll see we have things like Zotero, in a, uh, which is obviously not a generative AI program. In addition to things like uh, uh, Scrintle and PowerNotes and, and Unriddle.ai that do in certain instances use that generative technology. Um, and as you can see, often when it comes to recording information, they can be paired with uh, the writing phase. Something like Zotero, for instance, can generate citations that you've already recorded. This brings us to the analysis uh, phase, which is uh, where a student uh, evaluates the pertinent information um, and attempts to identify connections, patterns, discrepancies, relationships, outliers, what have you, um, that might lead to some new conclusion. Traditional methods were going to be like, if you're an ethnographer, for instance, a conventional code book, writing down what people are saying and then trying to circle, you know, related concepts and making those connections or statistical tests, um, pen and paper statistical tests. In the modern world, we have things like SPSS and Atlas TI that can do a lot of those traditional methods just quicker and digitally. Uh, and then with uh, when it comes to innovation, we have things like Elicit, which is a paper analysis tool that you can upload, you know, papers to, and it can kind of like analyze the content and help you uh, suss out information or determine what's going on in a way that's more than just reading it. And this is a phase where innovation is starting to dominate as well. And again, here are some here are some tools. Uh, we have things like Constellate and Elicit. Um, Constellate is also a text analysis tool uh, so that uh, you can, you know, analyze uh, corp corpuses of text and uh, uh, determine relationship and that sort of thing. But you also have uh, programs like LitMaps and ResearchRabbit that allow you to, again, kind of analyze connections between sources and authors and that sort of thing. 
Uh, this brings us to the writing phase, which is when a student converts that information, the raw preliminary information into a written form, uh, a kind of a polished written form, I, I guess you could say, facilitating the documentation, expression, and or communication of an idea or argument. Um, tools to help the writing process traditionally included things like, you know, peer review. You would hand your paper to someone else. They would read it and mark it up and hand it back to you uh, with, you know, all the errors noted in comments in the margins and that sort of thing. In the modern world, we had software, we have software like Word that can underline grammar issues and spelling mistakes. Um, older versions of Grammarly did this as well. And then the more innovative side of things are going to be those generated generative technologies like ChatGPT, Poe, and the newer versions of Grammarly that in addition to, you know, maybe catching errors or helping you uh, clarify sentences can actually help you write the content. You can, you know, maybe ask it for help in starting a paragraph or, or tell it to critique a paragraph or something like that. And it can take your information and help you expand that into something new. And this is a phase I, where innovation is definitely starting to dominate. And I think this is one of the phases where people are very much aware of that. And there's also a controversial element to that because it brings up the question of like, is this going to replace writers? Is it taking, uh, you know, are the algorithms that are being created studying copyrighted works? Is that ethical? That sort of thing. And then again, here are some software. Um, in addition to writing programs like Grammarly and Poe, we also have just those kind of chatbots like ChatGPT. And closely related to the writing uh, phase is the remixing phase, which is the phase in which a student will take extant information and via some sort of transformative technique, um, like sampling, collage, translation, paraphrase, what have you, they'll transform it into a new derivative work. And so the traditional approach here was paraphrasing techniques um, or getting someone to professionally translate a document that's written in, you know, 13th century Latin or whatnot. Um, these take one information in one form and kind of convert it into something new that is still connected to that old form, but is a thing in its own right. Um, the modern approach, you're going to have translation tools. I think Google Translate is probably one of the most common. And then you have the more innovative, innovative approaches, which is something like DeepL, which is a, a translation tool that uses um, generative technology, as well as tools like Chat PDF that allow you to, uh, you know, upload a PDF and then have it summarize the contents for you. So it's taking that information and condensing it down into something new. Um, this is a phase where innovation is is dominant, uh, is becoming dominant. Uh, again, this is controversial because it brings up questions of, like, if you ask the chatbot to paraphrase or to summarize an article, and then you use that text, who owns it? Is it ethical to do that? That sort of thing. And again, here are some programs, ChatGPT, as well as ChatPDF, and tools like Grammarly and DeepL. And then finally, we have the sharing information phase, which is the phase in which students will distribute, disseminate, or broadcast information to others, often to increase the visibility of that information to promote research or research productivity, or to raise awareness in some sense. And so traditional methods were, I, I guess you could say, all the way from, you know, nailing theses to a church door, to emails, to listservs, and to mailing lists, and everything in between. Uh, a more modern approach was some, is something like Dropbox, where you can place things in it, and then send it to someone else, or even to yourself. And then finally, we have more innovative methods like Papership, which basically just are taking the the modern approach and kind of taking it the, the next step further. In the case of Papership, I believe they mentioned something about bringing research into like the 2.0 era or something like that. Um, this is another area where modern methods are still largely the the dominant ones um you know dropbox and even traditional methods like email are still very very common um much of that is probably just due to the fact that without sufficient connection to someone else uh it's hard to share so if you if you have someone else's email and that's it really the only thing you can probably do to get that information to them is to email them you know um, but when more connections uh, between people start to develop, more connections between um, organizations and, and places start to develop, I would believe that the generative and innovative technologies are really probably going to take off and become more, more commonplace. And here we have an example of some of the sharing um, technologies. A lot of these are focused on something else like recording or analyzing or writing, but they also have a sharing feature that makes them useful and thus fits them into this phase. And so at this point, we would like to ask, is there a 
current go-to productivity tool that you all have that um, you might consider innovative or uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, even modern, but, you know, something that is is currently in use that is maybe starting to be developed a little more, be taken a little, uh, taken in a different direction, that sort of thing. Um, I think a good example would be something like Grammarly or even citation management softwares. And if you want, um, you can put those in the chat and we can kind of take a look at those here in a second. Uh, while you all think about that, I would like to mention a couple things. First off, like I said earlier, these technologies should not be thought of as belonging to a single phase. Um, consider ChatGPT, for instance. It, it's good at generating information. It's good at analyzing information. It's good at writing information, and it can help you remix that information. Um, the Workflow that we are proposing, however, should be thought of uh, when you when you take a tool and look at it according to our workflow. The thing we're asking is, what is that tool's optimal use? What phase of the of the process is this tool optimally used for? So something like ChatGPT could be very good at generating the generation phase, but it's not going to be good for the searching phase. Um, and so you would just kind of want to make make it be, be aware of that. Um, some tools are specifically focused on one phase and others are a little broader. And then I'd also like to point out that just because something is traditional or modern does not mean it's bad or obsolete or outdated. Um, innovative technologies, generative technologies can and do coexist with modern and traditional methods. Uh, I know for instance that like catalogers are often still keeping track of information uh, either in the modern sense, you know, on a database or in a in a traditional sense with a catalog somewhere. And that sort of technology can and often is useful when working with newer technologies as well. So there's a time and a place for everything. And we shouldn't think of old stuff as bad and the new stuff as good. Um, not only is that simplistic, but it also leads to, you know, um, assumptions about, it leads to less critical thinking about, about newer tools. Um, I will say that traditional methods gen to be uh, generally are time tested in the sense that, you know, we've been using them for decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, they often, however, are slower. So a card catalog organized by a really, really um, studious cataloger might be extremely uh, correct and, and uh, have all the information you need, but it's often going to be slower to access or to even produce. Uh, likewise, innovative methods can be uh, more easily abused by academic academic uh, ne'er do wells. You know, you can get people generating essays to cheat or making up citations or that sort of thing. Um, and they can also carry the risk of not being understood by the establishment. So, if you were to propose uh, the use of a specific generative tool um, for one of these phases, uh, and the faculty or or whoever you are are proposing it to don't know what it is they might say well that ain't that ain't real scholarship that's that's some newfangled stuff that we don't want to we don't want to mess with we want to do the old school method that we know is correct and sometimes that's fair sometimes a, a, the quote-unquote newfangled method is actually just sort of a flash in the pan but other times that innovation is going to eventually catch on and so we just need to be aware that, that there are people that that might not want to use it or recognize it at first. And you should be aware of that as well when you're trying to implement these tools um, when working with students. And then finally, there's often a gray area separating these categories from one another and their appropriate use. Um, the important thing in all of this is to be transparent about how you're using these tools, explain you know, clearly your methods and your approaches, educate people as to your methods and approaches, just make sure everything is open and out there so that people can understand how maybe you used this one generative tool to help you come up with an idea, but you used a more modern method to write it up and you used a traditional method to share it. Um, all of those, uh, uh, you know, just being open and, and, and transparent about that information is going to be key in moving forward, uh, we truly do believe. Um, before I get into that, I just wanted to point out that um, I really appreciate all the different tools that people have been mentioning in the chat. Um, we were cognizant of the fact that we could not even begin to start listing every possible tool, um, which 
I think helps emphasize why it's important for us to keep up with these things. Um, our graduate students will be asking us questions about various tools. And so the more we can do to be aware of them um, is important. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about um, some legal issues and ethical considerations. Um, there was a recent article from uh, American Libraries that um, was published in the March, April of 2024 issue that said that um, uh, they, they spoke with uh, five technology experts and throughout their interviews, um, each one of these uh, legal and ethical considerations came out. Um, so plagiarism, um, dealing with bias, misinformation, disinformation, those are all things that we have been dealing with before we even had these modern tools and these innovative tools. Um, issues of censorship um, are probably going to be exasperated with uh, AI, um, generative AI possibly changing text that we don't mean to or ignoring the way we're just, uh, the words that we're using. Um, there's definitely copyright considerations, um, but I think that uh, Paul and I were discussing that maybe the newer uh, or the, the increased emphasis on uh, data security and privacy um, with these new tools may not have been as much of a concern with our traditional or maybe even our modern, but with our innovative tools for um, this workflow, um, privacy and data security are definitely an issue. And um, for an example, we know that um, uh, Copilot um, is now helping to protect our students' um, privacy as they're using that chat option. And then the last thing we wanted to um, point out is that there's a lot of different ways to find out about tools. Certainly one is to just ask other people what they're using and uh, you know, just to rattle off some of them that you guys are using, Omnivore, um, Bibtex, Notability, um, Zotero has a lot of fans, um, Slack, Trello, Elicit is starting to be used, uh, Notation, uh, Notability, I'm not sure if I said that one. Um, so certainly that's one of the ways to to look for things. Um, one, another way that we looked for was just to look for um, blogs. We did searches for uh, workflows for graduate students. Um, there's, uh, we also discovered a website called Alternative 2, where you can look up a particular tool and ask for alternatives um, for that tool. Um, it uh, doesn't have everything, but you can make suggestions to have things added. Um, the two things I want to point out here is the 101 Innovations in Scholarly Communication. That's uh, that work of Kramer and Bozeman. Um, they have a uh, Google spreadsheet that has over 400 plus, I'm not sure how many different tools that they were uh, cataloging and describing um, in extensive detail um, back in uh you know, maybe 10, not even 10 years ago now. And some of those tools uh, were innovative um, and exploratory and have gone away, but some of them have been able to sustain themselves. They also have um, a lot of different workflows. Um, if you were to imagine a workflow based on just Google products, they envision that. Um, so there's a lot of different um, visualizations and reports, and I encourage you to, to look at those and build on those um, for your own training. And then um, Ithaca R uh, S and R has um, created a generative AI product tracker um, that is broken down in categories of general purpose, discovery, teaching and learning, workflow, writing, coding, image generation, and even other, because there are things that don't quite fit in those categories. Um, so we think that's one of the places that um, we'll probably be able to keep up adding to that list. Um, but uh, we encourage everybody to just share anything that they um, find useful and uh, would like to share. And I believe we we managed to get through this much faster. I probably skipped over some of my notes. So uh, we'd love to have questions and discussion. Before we head on to new questions, um, I just wanted to pull out from the chat 
Um, Karen mentioned that you could add data visualization tools to your framework as well. And Giovanna mentioned um, that you could use Excel to record core, um, codes and also to um, summarize in pivot tables. And beyond that, um, everything in chat from this point on would be new. Um, anyone, you can unmute yourselves, you can ask to unmute, or you can just um, type in chat, whatever you'd like to do. Could I have the first question while people are thinking? Um, I have been through, as many of us have, um, you know, you remember when Y2K was going to kill us all, and then it, it didn't. Um, all of the concern and everything about um, things like chat GPT, students aren't doing their work anymore. Um, is this really a legit concern or do you, having looked at this a little bit, think that maybe it's more on the side of uh, benign use? And again, I'm, I'm asking just kind of um, undergrad too, but mostly at the grad level. Um, I would say that some of the graduate students that I'm working with are are uh, innovators themselves. They're out there, they wanna try new tools and have brought my attention to many. Um, I didn't realize that Research Rabbit was out there until a graduate student started asking me about it. And I went, oh my gosh, I need to catch up with um, what kind of tools there are. Um, and that particular student was using Research Rabbit and uh, LitMap um, and other tools. Uh, I've had graduate students ask me about illicit. Um, they're interested in knowing if we're gonna start paying for things. And that's one of the challenges that Paul and I have had is like, how do we decide um, what to try to get our institution to license? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of free me stuff that people are trying out. I think I missed part of the second part of that question. Um, is it something that we should be worried about? I mean, I imagine it would be kind of a hard sell to get an administration to buy a tool like this when all they hear is it will just make kids not do their work. Yeah, I think that there's a there's a very real issue at, at stake there. Um, the And I hate using this argument, but I, I think it is convincing that now that the technology is kind of out there, it's, gonna, it's out there. We can't sort of get it back in the box. Um, so there are certain technologies that I think are just inevitably going to become a part of the everyday world. I know Microsoft is is starting to really push um, like Copilot and those those generative uh, technologies, and I'm pretty sure Word's probably going to start inter integrating that sort of text here uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and so in that sense, once the hype kind of dies down and once the 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 uh, the question of the unknown starts to fade away, I think some of those technologies will start to be accepted as commonplace. At the same time, I, I do think that there is a very, very real issue if we teach students to just exclusively use a lot of these tools. Um, perhaps that's, you know, stating the obvious. And I think that's where something like this comes into play, where we have to say, okay, yeah, chat GPT can do a lot of really cool things and write essays for you. But, you know, why are you here to write an essay? What's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of your graduate degree and your graduate career and your research? Like you're trying to discover something, try to grow as a scholar yourself. So if you use these tools, that's fine. Just be open about it as well as don't use them as a crutch. Use them as as something something to enable and, and to propel you, to, to let you reach higher heights than you might otherwise uh, be able to. Um, and... I think if it's put, I don't want to say spin because that's kind of a negative term, but if it's put that way, I think some institutions will start to realize the benefit and then combined with the fact that it's going to become ubiqu ubiquitous, I think that will help a little bit. Uh, Paul and I are also parts of um, various discussion groups about AI. Um, we have a group here in the libraries and there's also a university wide. And one of the things that comes out in those discussions frequently is that um, you still need to have a lot of domain knowledge to critically think about how what these generative AI tools are producing. And um, so I think if we just stay calm and go, this is just another tool, and that traditional tools are still good, that modern tools are still good, that, um, that the main thing is, is that we're critically thinking about 
how we're using them. And they're only supplementing our work, making some things a little easier to, to do quickly, but not they're not replacing our thinking. There's a comment in the chat I want to do. Um, I want to make sure that you catch, and it's from Stephen, who says, this was amazing. So good job. Oh. oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> would you consider social media or repositories as tools for the sharing phase? And that is asked by Sabine. Um, I can I can touch on that one. I think absolutely. In fact, um, when it comes to sort of the sharing of information, uh, a lot of the tools that I was looking at or that we were finding when it came to sharing, it was, you know, share on Twitter or share on Facebook or what have you. And so that social media integration, I think, is key. And while social media might be, you know, totally Web 2.0 or whatever, um, it's something that the Academy has not integrated nearly as much as the rest of the world has into it, kind of the everyday workflow. So I definitely think that that is a part of it and that we'll be seeing that more and more. Okay. And I kind of hope so, too, because I feel like that's a great way to get information out there because it's used by, you know, millions of people. Daniela comments that Scopus and Web of Science are already working on including AI for searching information. And then she asks about um, when you use AI for systematic reviews, in which phase would you use it? Oh, that's a tough one. I feel like you could use it in multiple areas. I think uh, I'm part of a systematic review team um, trying to get better at this as well. And I think that um, tools like Elicit, uh, uh, where you have already identified all of your um, articles that are in scope, and you want to have a yet another reviewer, um, I think that a, a generative AI tool could be used as that other reviewer. Um, I think it could also help with the initial stage of trying to figure out what words to be searching um, in those controlled searches. But I'd be interested in discussing you know, other options as well. Rebecca is encouraging the citing of tools. Um, Victor has a plan to promote tools to faculty and grad students, but to also target faculty and administrators to address AI misconceptions and fears, which is a very important thing. Um, Paolo has a, a link that he says is the best thing is read about the probable impact of AI on scholarly publishing and research. Um, I Thank think you. one person has unmuted if, if that is correct. If anyone wanted to just ask a question. No? Okay. One thing that uh, I would like to, I think would be useful to add, this is kind of just more about generative technology in general, is I've found that when I use it, if I treat it, if I treat, you know, Copilot or Chat GPT or what have you as a, my little robot buddy that I just am kind of like throwing ideas at, I often can come up with new thoughts or new, new, new avenues of thought. Um, and it's not that the the program is, you know, doing all the work. It's just I'm talking at it and it's given me options. So that's kind of with that generating idea avenue. But I like to think of it that way. I like instead of the scary matrix robots, I like to think of it as a little cute. If any of you are Adventure Time fans, Bemo from from Adventure Time, you know, just someone to talk to who can kind of chirp things back and give me some ideas. I found that very useful. So not the movie Terminator and Skynet where they're exactly going. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, although it would be kind of interesting if the chat GPT had like an Arnold Schwarzenegger voice, <laughs> that'd be pretty fun. Liz is enjoying your reference to BMO. Did not expect <laughs> to get that today. <laughs> Do you have a, a, is there an easy button for those of us who don't spend a lot of time on these tools? I mean, where, where do you think we should begin? Playing around for me, I, it all started with playing around with Chat, chat GPT and Copilot. Um, you can just ask it stuff, and it'll spit out text. And when all of this stuff started, I, that was where I was really worried and scared about. And then I started playing with it, and I started to realize how it. I'm not going to pretend like I understand how the algorithms work, but I kind of saw what was going on, and that made me interested and in, and in kind of encouraged me to continue looking at this stuff. So those are those are interesting tools to at least play around in. Um, although if you are worried about your data being harvested for, you know, 
uh, companies to use. That's something to be aware of, but. Okay. I would suggest playing around with tools where you can um, control the input. Um, so um, a tool like Elicit that allows you, or Unriddle that allows you to input your own article and ask questions of that article. Um, I, I, I would be really, really cautious of having just chat GPT answer questions without providing it something to look at. Um, we've had definitely, I'm, I'm sure like most of you have had experiences of uh, library users having hallucination citations. So I would try to avoid that by inputting content. Yeah, and I should mention that by by using Chat GPT, I, I just mean, you know, asking it like just random questions just to see how it's processing them. Not to say like, oh, what's the capital of, you know, Yugoslavia or what was the capital of Yugoslavia? And then just putting it, whatever it says into a paper and publishing it. That obviously wouldn't would not be good. But just playing around with it, I, I found that you can see where it starts to break down too, where it starts to have issues. Um and then you can kind of go from there. Okay. Um, yeah, and put on your librarian cap where you're mm -hmm. doing a reference interview and, and start putting that kind of content into your your chat. Um, so like, I'm a librarian. What is uh, the Library of Congress subject headings for? And ask, you know, tell it what you're looking into and have it feedback. Um, so I did that in a class where uh, we threw in some words so what the situation was, and it was pretty accurate in providing us with Library of Congress subject headings to look for books. Okay, I'm going to answer Natalie's question is, will your slides be appended to the conference repository? Um, all of the recordings and all of the slides today will be in the repository. Um, it's going to take a couple of weeks. Um, Kelly says that Scopus AI also suggests research questions, including deeper questions. Have you thought about how AI tools will change the nature of question asking and problem solving? I've thought about it, but I certainly am not an expert on it. Um, I, I do kind of wonder if it's going to create uh, um, sort of a standard way of asking for things. Um, but I, as an instruction librarian, I see it in a positive way, because in many ways, what you have to do to have a constructive conversation with ChatGPT is similar to what we would do with, with a reference interview. So I think it could actually improve um, students' abilities to ask questions that are gonna be meaningful and get out what they want from them. I think there's also the potential for the technology to just keep probing people to ask. I, I'm, I'm reminded of the, that story of how, I don't remember where it was or when it was, but back in the day there was like a, a very, very rudimentary computer that had, could like voice something. And the people that were working on it started to, like talking to it because they felt like it was almost like a good therapist, but it was just sort of repeating back what they were saying. And I feel like that could be the case with AI where you, you say, is this a good thesis statement? And it just questions you, you know, like, why are you saying this? Or, well, that, that sounds kind of adversarial, but you know, like uh, you mentioned this thing, what about this concept? Have you thought about this? You know, it just keeps asking you these, what if or why questions. And then you can start to broaden. You're like, oh yeah, I guess I didn't think about that. Or, or that's a really, that's a really bad observation that the computer made. Uh, you know, obviously it it's not the, that's not the answer to, or not the question to pursue, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, Sue says, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my concerns is for writers who use study participant quotes in their work. Do our IRB permissions need to include the use of AI as part of our consenting process? In terms of um, like using AI to transcribe those interviews? Uh, I do not know. Sue, uh, Wayne. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, I, I was just think, kind of thinking out loud in the, the chat. Um, so if we're using AI tools to analyze the data, the raw data, is that data then being ingested and are the words of our participants being used to train the model without their oh. knowledge or consent? And then also if we're using it to rework paragraphs um, as we're writing, that has the same type of of issue if the quotations are included in those sections. I think the cat's out of the bag where when it comes to things that are published 
being ingested because they're out there more I think it, the public. I think it depends entirely on the program because something like chat GPT mm. is not actually capturing the words necessarily, you know, or it's not like searching the internet. Um, it's, it's just an algorithm that has been trained to kind of produce the next most reasonable thing. So there are some programs I know, um, like the writing aids that I've looked at that, that don't store the information. They just kind of look at it in that snapshot in time and make suggestions or propose changes about the structure or possible ideas and then move on to the next thing. Of course, this is assuming that all of these companies and these organizations are, are being transparent with how their technology actually works. And that is the big worry, I think. The biggest issue with, with these programs is that depending on the company that is creating it, hosting it, organizing it, public, you know, what have you, um, there could obviously be malicious use. Um, and so we just always need to be vigilant and aware of that. Okay, Rebecca suggests perplexity, uh, but we've realized that perplexity has been blocked at one school. Um, there is a, a, a recent uh, Freakonomics uh, talking about um, Google and perplexity being uh, possible uh, contender for Google's dominance. Mm -hmm. Yune says that the free version of GP chat isn't really updated and is more prone to mistakes. Um, the updated version has to be paid for monthly and can pose a financial strain on students. Uh, Liz is mentioning Eliza, the first chat bot. Mm -hmm. And then we are cut up. Any new questions or comments? And if you can just unmute yourselves, that'd be great. I've been giving unmute permissions to people and I'm not sure if I have to do that or not. I'll just say really quick, um, there, I noticed there was some comments about cost. Um, one of the things that Paul and I are, are trying to grapple with along with our other colleagues is uh, how do we decide what to promote based on possible longevity of the tool? So we figure that the people that come to us are, are not typically those that are going to always try the new thing. Um, we're more likely to have graduate students who are um, coming straight from their undergraduate and uh, work and realizing that whatever habits they have for researching and writing are not quite fitting. And so they're looking for alternatives or someone who is coming back to school after years of being out and um, they're realizing again that they need to gain some new skills and change some habits on how they're doing um, literature reviews. Um, so we're more interested in trying to figure out what might be those tools that uh, have some longevity to them that we might be able to convince a university to have a site license for. Um, for an example, um, site um, S-C-I-T-E um, was recently purchased by the same company that provides um, articles through Galaxy, I mean, Article Galaxy. So that one's already working well with libraries. So is that one gonna survive? Um, whereas other similar tools might not. Does your university have an official policy concerning AI? There's been a lot of discussion at mine, but no one seems to have come up with one. I don't know if we do. We have like, an, uh, like kind of a working <laughs> group that is monitoring it and keeping track of everything mm. to best of our ability, at least kind of unofficially, but I don't know if we have like an official policy out. Uh, different instructors might have um, policies in place in their syllabi, but not all of them do. I've seen it in our syllabi for um, computing. Those are the only instructors that I've seen. And Roman says that his university has an AI working group to which no librarians were invited. Boo! boo. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, we have a really good relationship with people in our Centers for Teaching Excellence. And one, uh, Doug Ward, who works there, um, is the person that started our, one of the people that started our lab, uh, university-wide discussion group. Hmm. Okay, Sue says UNLV statement is for instructors to lay out the guidelines in the syllabus. Um, but some programs appear to be blocked centrally. And mm. Rebecca is asking, is anyone here from University of Michigan, someone at the conference I know, at least one person is, um, that she read that their campus had developed tools for campus users to help preserve privacy. Mm. 
So if anyone here is from Michigan right now and you want to unmute, please do. Anyone else? Okay, if there are no additional questions or comments, I'd like to thank you both very sincerely for presenting this session for the TLGS 2024 conference. <clears throat> we really appreciate you sharing your insights and questions with us.